You ready for the word? This is my Bible. It is the word of God and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the word says I am, seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion and power. I have what the word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive as I'm taught the word of God. My life has changed for the better and I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to launch out of... Uh, two scriptures, both of them in Matthew chapter 6, and I don't know that we'll rehearse this every Sunday, but we may. The title this morning is Money and Murder. Say it out loud, Money and Murder. Money and murder. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 33, Jesus also said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these spirituals shall be added unto you. Is that what it says? No, seek ye first the kingdom of God and, all, and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Now, let me give you two things I learned from Dr. Lester Summerall many, many, many years ago in my living room. You ought to write them down. Two principles. If a man's not right with his money, that man is not right. If a man is not right with his money, that man is not right. And the second principle he gave me many, many years ago, if you don't have a man's money, he was talking to me, if you don't have a man's money, you don't have that man's heart. And, of course, he got that out of Matthew 6, 21. For where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. Now, let's go to Genesis 4. And uh, it's been here the whole time. It's inexcusable. People miss it. First book of the Bible. It's not the first book that was written. Probably Job was the first book written. But... Uh, it's the first book in our Bible. It is the first book of what the Jewish folks call the Pentateuch, the five, the book of the law. And here we have Moses recounting the story of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, verse 1, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Everybody say his brother. Say it again, his brother. his brother. Say it again, his brother. his brother. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Everybody say some. some. Say it again, some. some. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Everybody say firstborn. firstborn. Say firstborn. Firstborn. See, we've got a whole generation of Christians and they want to put God last, but when they have an emergency, they want God to put them first. Didn't we just read, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So Cain brought some and Abel brought firstborn. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering but Cain and his offering, did he did not look. And on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now, I'm going to give you some revelation on Cain that maybe you've never ascertained. And the reason is we're going to leave here and we're going to go and we're going to look at every time Cain is mentioned in the New Testament. And we're going to let the New Testament interpret the Old Testament, which is the way we ought to study the Word of God. All right, so we have two things going on here. We've got, first of all, 
that Cain brought some and Abel brought firstborn. But there is also something else going on here. Because it says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Not just his offering. The Lord looked with favor on Abel, Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So it's not just about some and first. There's more going on than some and first. They're intertwined with the other thing we're going to get to. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And this is what we face. The blessing of the Lord generates anger. And people don't want to believe testimonies when we say, uh, we just read one. They gave uh, an offering as unto the Lord, as led by the Lord, and got a 200-fold return in, what, 80 days? People don't want to believe that, because if they believe that, they'd have to acknowledge God, and they'd have to acknowledge God answers prayer, and they'd have to acknowledge God pays attention to money. So it's easier for them to believe that you're hinky. Because, see, if they believe that God is alive, if they believe there is a God, if they believe God pays attention to money, and they're broke and they're messed up, they can't deal with the horrifying fact that if they had conducted themselves differently, they would have a 200-fold return. It's no different than people getting on the scale. I was so happy the other day. Uh, we, we went to visit Derek Christina, and I took my scale. I got to know what's going on. Maybe you can walk in the dark, but I got to know what's going on. And especially when I'm around Derek Hill, because I'm telling you what, I cannot keep up. And so I ordered a bathroom scale to replace and put in our house, and I loaded the batteries in and got on it, and it said I weighed 151 pounds. And I, first off, I was going to start dancing and praising the Lord, and then I thought... Uh, it's probably calibrating. Because this first time, I, then I got on it the second time and it told me the ugly truth. <laughs> but you know what this generation does? They walk over, they, they leave the bathroom scale, they walk over and they look in the mirror and say, well, I have a medical condition. I'll tell you one thing that'll horrify you, start counting calories, you'll be shocked at how much you've been eating. And I find myself eating less because it's just too much time to put all that in there, figure it out, you know? How many calories is 3,000 tortilla chips? I mean, it's a hassle to figure it out. My point is personal responsibility. Say it out loud, personal responsibility. Say it again, personal responsibility. Say it again, personal responsibility. So it's not just a matter of some and first. There's more going on than some and first. Because the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And the thing I want you to see is, so Cain was very angry. The blessing of the Lord makes people angry. And let me tell you what, until you can rejoice in the blessing of the Lord in your brother's life, until you can rejoice in the blessing of the Lord in your sister's life, your heart is not right. Amen. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right. It's been there all the time. I know people come to Faith Christian Center, they visit here, and they think we made this up about doing. They think we made this up about taking action on the Word of God. It was there all the time. It's there in the first book of the Bible. And God said <clears throat> to Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do what is right, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And that's what we've been teaching the last two years in August in the week of increase. That's what we've been teaching on Wednesday night. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. 
It could be overeating. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be porn. Porn's huge now. It doesn't matter what the sin is. And you have to understand Satan, Satan's just a lousy dog. And Satan doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to Satan how he ties you up. He just wants you tied up. And so if he can mess you up with drugs, then that's, that's okay with him. If he can mess you up with a, an affair at work, that's okay with him. If he can mess you up with alcohol, it doesn't matter to him how he messes you up. If he can mess up a, a teenager with porn. In other words, it doesn't matter to Satan how. And, and he's like a flip chart guy. You know, how about porn? Won't go for porn? Okay, how about marijuana? Won't go for marijuana? Okay, how about alcohol? And he'll just keep coming. And he says, sin, God, this is God, says to Cain, and I want you to see in the Old Testament, God gets a bad rap in these universities and these seminaries, how kind and gracious and merciful he was because he's trying to help this guy. In modern terminology, we would say God is life coaching him. I mean, it'd be like coming in for counseling and we would say, look, man, you got a bad attitude. You, if you don't change your attitude, you don't change your mouth, you don't change your conduct, you're not going to pull ahead. You're going to go backwards. That's right. It's life coaching. That's right. And he says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door and it, sin, seeks to master you, but you must master it. And I want you to see that this is all intertwined with money. Oh, it's not money. It's, there's, it doesn't mention dollars or gold or whatever. Well, what do you think grain's worth when you go to Whole Foods or Sprouts? What, are they, what do you have to get up, give up to get some grain? Money. Talk to me. What do you have to give up to get some grain? Money. You got to give up money. Or if you want to go buy some uh, beef today or chicken or whatever it is you do, what do you have to part with to get your hands on something that was at one time livestock. What do you have to part with? Money. So we're talking about money. Giving it up. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So now we have, now we have one brother attacking another brother based in anger over money. And this is what's going on right now. Nobody, nobody here this morning has ever said, you know what, I need an attorney. So I need to look up and find out the attorney in Tarrant County who has lost the most cases percentage-wise, and I need to go hire that attorney. I mean, nobody would be that stupid. Amen. Nobody would say, uh, my grandmother died and she left me $10,000, so I want to invest this money, so I want to look up, I want to look up and I want to find the stockbroker in Tarrant County who has lost the most money for his clients in the last 10 years because I want, I want a humble stockbroker. Because if I, if I invest my money with a winner, well, maybe I won't be able to take his attitude, me being the snowflake that I am. So I want to I wanna find a humble stock break, broker, and I want to find the guy that lost the most, or gal, or gal, equal opportunity, loser looker. I want to find, <laughs> find the stock broker that has lost the most money for their client because I want a humble stock broker. Now, nobody, nobody would ever be that stupid, but this is how they pick preachers. And I'm sorry, because if you had come to the church back in 1984 in the hotel, uh, I could have rung your bell, because we didn't have anything. We had $20,000 from the sale of our first house, Jimmy Carter's inflation, the sale of our first house after tithing on it. We had $20,000, but we used that $20,000 to pioneer this church. So in effect, except for some money, maybe in some IRAs, we, we didn't have anything. Tell your neighbor, those days are gone forever. Gone. But if you had met me in 1984, I could have rung your bell. 
But see, if somebody takes action on the Word of God for 36 years, it's been 36 years since we pioneered this church, well, there's going to be some fruit show up. There's going to be some blessing show up. And to complain about the fruit and to complain about the blessing is not to pick a fight with me and not to criticize me. It is to pick a fight with God and to pick a fight with the Word of God. I didn't design the system. I've just been working it. Tell your neighbor, Pastor Gene didn't design the system. He's just been working it. I mean, this couple that gave the seed and got a 200-fold return, you think that's the last seed they'll ever sow? No. So if, if somebody gives a seed as led by the Holy Spirit and the Lord dumps 200-fold into their hands within 80 days, what do you think that couple, if they're intelligent, will do again? They'll work it because it works. Now, you shouldn't be surprised at this because I'm not going to have a show of hands, but there are people here this morning that have been in Alco Alcoholics Anonymous or uh, Narcotics Anonymous, and they say at the end of every meeting, it works if you, if you work it. So keep working it. And we haven't said it that way at Faith Christian Center, but really that's kind of in every message. You know, it works if you work it. The word will work, but I put that on social media once, and oh my gosh, the hate that came back. The word will work for anybody who works the word, <clears throat> and all the hate coming back. Well, you, have, you make it sound like, you know, we're supposed to do what we're doing and expect a return. Well, I'm intelligent. Of course I expect a return. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And he attacked him over, now listen, watch it. And this is in the first book of the Bible, fourth chapter. It's been there the whole time. There's no excuse for anybody missing it. Cain attacked Abel over two things. He attacked him over money and he attacked him over the favor of God. And all Cain had to do to get the favor of God is do what Abel had done. Right. Say it out loud. All Cain had to do, had to, do to get the favor of God, favor of God was, do was do what Abel, what Abel had, done. had done. What authority do I have for saying that? Because God himself says, if you do... Verse 7, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? Now we're going to get to this in the New Testament. The New Testament commenting on Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? Because all of this is interrelated. Money and murder. Now, we don't, we don't have time to go there, but when you get over to the book of James, he, he likens an abuse of tongue with murder. Character assassination is a kind of murder. Somebody worked their whole life to build a good reputation, and you come along and you slander them, you can kill their reputation with your mouth. And so, flippant, am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, since you brought it up, you are. You are your brother's keeper. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What do you think the Lord's thinking right now? Because since Roe v. Wade, we've murdered 61 million babies in the womb in this country. Now, you can all do what you want to do, and I'm not saying we have too many choices because, you know, what are we going to do? All we have is the choices said before us, but let me tell you what, you're not going to murder no 61 million babies in the womb and make America great again. Judgment is coming. 
That's why we encourage everybody to get everything paid off, get out of debt, get it all paid off, stack up money like cordwood. And then I, I have no biblical basis for this, but I like to believe that it'll all happen after the rapture. Because I'm not really hardwired for trouble. I like comfort. Amen. 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 But you can't murder 61 million innocent human beings and walk in the blessing of the Lord. And their blood cries out. Not from the ground. Their, their blood cries out from the sewer system. Because at these abortion clinics, they have commercial grade garbage disposals, grinders, and they take all those hands and all those feet and all those skulls and all those uh, rib cages and they put them in these grinders and it goes into the sewer system and all that's recycled. So the water you're drinking today, you're drinking dead babies. But hey, climate change. The worst pollution going on on the planet is not carbon, is it monox monox monoxide? It's the blood of innocent children. That's the worst pollution going on. Because you can mess up the sky and turn it gray, but that won't bring the judgment of God. You murder, you murder the innocent. The blood will call out to God. Well, he hasn't done anything about it so far. Well, how do you know that? How do you know what kind of country we could live in and how much prosperity we could have walked in if we had not gone down this road? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to you because the title this morning, what's the title of the message? What is the title of the message? Money and murder. The Lord said, and I want you to understand it's all the same people. All the people that are pro-abortion are against the death penalty. And all the people that are pro-abortion are against tithing. And all the people that are pro-abortion are against the blessing of the Lord. They're the same people. They're the same people. Once you get your mind around this, you're freer to prosper. They're all the same people. Now you are under a curse. Uh-oh. Verse 11. Say it out loud. Now you are under a curse. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And that right there describes most of the cruisomatics I've come across in the 36 years since I pioneered this church. They're restless wanderers. And when they work the ground, it doesn't yield crops for them. All right. And I don't take anything special upon myself. But I just preach the word. That's what I do. I teach the word. I preach the word. That's what I do. Now, the county is not full of places that teach and preach the word. If the county were full of places that teach and preach the word, they might say, well, I don't like Pastor Gene's hair. I don't like the way Pastor Sue dresses. And I'm going to go to one of these 55 other places that teaches and preach the word. I get it. But that's not, where, that's not the America we live in. Now, how do you go find somewhere else where they actually teach and preach the word of God? So when people make these changes, what are they doing? In effect. What are they doing? In effect. They're rejecting the Word. See, and the Word, the Word is what it's all about. Say it out loud. The Word, the Word, the Word. The word, the word. The word. The word. 
The Word's what it's all about. It's, I mean, 100% in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's about the Word. To, to one man, the Word of God is a stumbling block. To the next man, the Word of God is the cornerstone. Can you see that? In other words, to the one man, he's offended by the Word. To the other man, he builds his life on the Word. But it's the same Word. And nobody's got the right to change the word. When you work the ground that will no longer yield its crops for you, you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. All right. So let's go to the New Testament and let's look at every place where Cain is mentioned in the New Testament. And let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. All right, so here we come to it. What is the real difference between Cain and Abel? Yeah, buddy. Steve said faith. What's the real difference between Cain and Abel? Now, people don't want to acknowledge this. They don't want to admit this. Well, I, just, I wasn't raised that way. I wasn't taught that. My last 15 pastors didn't teach it that way. Blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is, people have faith or they don't. When Jesus said, when I come back to planet Earth, I'm going to be looking for one thing. What did he say he was going to be looking for? When, when I come back to Earth, I'm going to be looking for tolerance. Is that what he said? When I come back to Earth, I'm going to be looking for... Uh, uh, I'm going to be looking for casually dressed preachers. When I come back to earth, I'm going to be looking. What did he say he was going to be looking for? He said there was one thing he was going to be looking for when he came back to earth. What is the one thing Jesus said he was going to be looking for when he came back to earth? Faith. Faith. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, if we believe that, why would we not take action on that? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If I believe that, why would I not take action on that? You know, I mentioned, was it last Sunday or was it Wednesday night that one of these uh, presidential candidates, I think running for president, I mean a, a politician, I think he's running for president, mocked us and made fun of those people who believe in Noah's Ark. Well... I got really blessed believing in Noah's Ark. I'm happily married believing in Noah's Ark. My children, I mean, I've never spent one nickel on an attorney for my children or a bail bondsman for my ch children. Uh, I've never spent one nickel on a lawyer for child custody battles. I mean, I got, I got pretty blessed believing in Noah's Ark. Well, I, I, I can believe in the New Testament, but I don't see any need to believe in the Old Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You either believe it or you don't. And how does God know? How does God know whether or not you believe it? Well, when you read the rest of Hebrews 11, and we don't have time to do that, it's all about action. By faith, Rahab sent the spies off in a different direction. By faith, Moses forsook the pleasures of Egypt. By faith, Abraham headed out for a land that he did not know. So how does God know whether or not you have faith? How does God know whether or not I have faith? Talk to me. How does God know? By, By what? By action. So when, when Cain gave some, that's not all that was going on. When Abel gave first, that's not all that was going on. There was a heart involved. There was Cain's heart involved in giving some. There was Abel's heart involved in giving first. It wasn't just about the offering, it was about the heart. But a right heart will lead to right action, and a wrong heart will lead to wrong action. As night follows day, right behavior will follow right believing, and wrong behavior will follow wrong believing. 
So it says in verse 4, by faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. All right, let's deal with that because a lot of you have been in churches and they've lied to you and they've told you it doesn't matter how much you give God. Moses taught, we were just reading in Genesis, Moses was the author of Genesis, Moses taught that we are to give in proportion to the way the Lord our God has blessed us. So if you're here this morning and you make a million dollars a year, you ought not be giving what somebody sitting here gives who makes $50,000 a year. We are to give to the Lord our God in proportion to the way the Lord our God has blessed us. And I don't care what Bernie Sanders thinks about it. Uh, the guy that is faithful at 50,000 and God graduates him to 75,000, he's faithful at 75,000 and he graduates to 100,000, he's faithful at 100,000 and God graduates him to a quarter of a million. People don't put this together. Every time you step up financially, that means your tithes and your offerings are increasing, which basically means you have more seed in the ground, which basically means because you're a believer and not a doubter because it, nobody, would, nobody would take action on this. Nobody would tithe. Nobody would give offerings as led by the Holy Spirit of God if they didn't believe this stuff. Are you kidding me? So the only reason they would give God a tithe, the only reason they would give offerings as led by the Lord above and beyond the tithe is they believe. Well, now because they graduated from 50 to 75,000, they're tithing, they're giving offerings, not at the $50,000 level anymore, but the $75,000 level, well, there's more seed in the ground and they're doing it in faith. If they didn't have faith, they wouldn't be doing it. Charles Capps used to tell the story about the guy that went to his pastor and he said, you know, he said, I, I just got to get out of this place where I'm at. I'm just not making any money at all. But he said, I just can't get my mind around tithing, you know, $100 a week. I just can't get my mind around it. I just can't get my mind around it. And the pastor worked with him and talked him into it. And it wasn't too long that this guy comes back to the pastor and he said, you know, you talked me into tithing. It cost me $100 a week and, and, and it worked. I have to admit it worked. But he said, now my tithe is $1,000 a week. He said, I just can't, I just, I just can't believe, I just can't, I can't give God no $1,000 a week. I can't afford to give God a $1,000 a week. The pastor said, no problem. I'll just, we'll just, here, take my hand. We'll just believe God. God will take you back to the $100 a week tithe level. <laughs> And he lifted his hand, said, he said, Pastor, forget everything I said. Just pretend I never came in here at all. <laughs> because, see, if you don't go forwards, you're going backwards. Right. Now, everybody's going to, I hear the objection in my spirit, man. Somebody say, well, I've got an unsaved neighbor, and he cheats on his wife. And, and he's a whoremonger, and he's a drunk, and he's this, and he's that. And he doesn't go to church, and he doesn't tithe. And he just keeps pulling ahead. He just gets richer and richer and richer. Well, yeah, but you're talking about somebody who's unsaved. God is not monitoring the behavior of the unsaved. If, you, if I go to Kroger's and somebody else's kid is running up and down the aisles and opening cereal boxes and uh, eating Snickers bars without paying for them, I don't pay it any mind whatsoever because they're not mine. God's not monitor, monitoring the behavior of the wicked, but he does monitor the behavior of his own. And God spoke well of his offerings. Let's go over to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Anybody getting anything out of this? 1 John 3, verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Now, people don't want to believe it, but all of this has to do with love. Faith has to do with love. Money has to do with love. You're using your money for selfishness or you're using your money for love. Do not be like Cain. See, he's talking about loving your brother, then he brings up Cain. Why? Because Cain is the original example because he was flippant with God and said, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. And I hear another objection in somebody's mind right now. Look, this church every Friday, every Friday we send out money to ministries that emphasize ministry to the poor. Every Friday we send out money to feed the hungry. Every Friday we're sending out money. Amen. So I'm not just, I'm not just uh, 
teaching this stuff, we're doing this stuff. We're walking the walk. We're not just talking the talk. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? All right, tell your neighbor, now we're going to find out why. So why did Cain murder Abel? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now we have it again. Now we have it again. Now I have to admit, this has only been in the Bible a couple of thousand years. So you've only had, the church has only had a couple of thousand years to ignore this. Actions. Say it out loud. God judges actions. In fact, say it out loud three times. God judges actions. Well, what, what, what are these preachers preaching? Well, it doesn't matter what I do. All right, just go have an affair. Let your wife find out and then say to her, my actions shouldn't matter. <laughs> of course they matter. What kind of nonsense is that? Doesn't matter how, what we do. Doesn't matter how we live. Are you even reading this? Why did Cain make, or why did Cain murder Abel? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Jesus said, no one who's given up homes, brothers, sisters, fields, lands for my sake and for the gospels shall fail to receive in this life a hundred times as much in this life and with them persecutions. And so... You do realize, right? Let's just do a little reality. You do realize, right? That we're no more, we're, we're, we're not anywhere near toward the high end of blessed preachers. We just don't hide it. I mean, I could, I could name names and I don't want to do that, but I'm talking about some famous Southern Baptist guys. And if we knew what their net worth was and we knew what our net worth was, we're not even, forget about it, we're not even in the same solar system. But they hide it. If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. We were still at the hotel, and a man gave me my first Rolex. It was a very modest Rolex. It was two-tone. It wasn't 18-karat gold. It was 14-karat gold, two-tone. It had just a few diamonds on it, maybe three diamonds. And uh, I felt bad. I felt bad. Because the church, I mean, we had bought the, five, the three and a quarter acres up there at I-30 and Fielder Road. Uh, but we, we, we weren't anywhere near starting construction. I felt bad. I felt bad. I felt bad. I mean, I'm supposed to wear this Rolex at the hotel. I mean, we're pioneering this church. Uh, so I took it to this bank and I put it in the safe deposit box and I forgot about it. And I'm stomping around that three and a quarter acres, praying and believing God, believing God for money. See, when you set your heart to believe God for money, you better brace yourself for a course correction. Because when you go to believe in God for money, he's going to come along and he's going to correct you. If God, if God, if God would correct Cain, who, whom hated God, don't you think God would correct you if you say you love God? That's right. That's right. And he, I'm out there stomping around one day, three and a quarter acres, 5 a.m. prayer. We started 5 a.m. prayer at the land in 1985 before we had even started construction. And the Lord spoke to me. I mean, I wasn't praying. I wasn't praying about it. I wasn't even mindful of the watch. I was, I was embarrassed by it. I put it in the bank in the safe deposit box. I, I wasn't praying about that. I was praying about whatever. I was probably praying about believing God for the money to build that building. I'm stomping around out there on that damp grass, you know, dew, damp. My shoes getting wet every morning. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, where's the watch? And I said, well, Father, you know all things. You know that I put it in the safe deposit box. And he asked me a question that changed my life, and I'm hoping it'll change yours. 1985 or 6, maybe 7, somewhere in that time frame, he asked me, he said, 
a question that changed my life. He said, are you ashamed of my blessings? I said, no, sir. And that week I went down there and I got that watch and I wore it. I'm not ashamed of God's blessings. The world's not ashamed. You know, I, I didn't watch them. Was it Emmys or Golden Globes or whatever that trash fest was they had? Uh, they're bragging about their abortions. If, they, if, they, if, if the rich and famous of Hollywood get together and brag about their abortions, why should we be ashamed of the blessings of the Lord? He says, because his own actions, Cain's actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. So the world's going to hate us. And, and actually, if the world doesn't hate you, you're not doing Christianity right. Amen. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. And so we're talking about Money and murder. This happens all the time, all the time. People, pull, people say, Pastor, I want to show you my new car. And, and you know why they do that? Because maybe they don't have friends. Maybe they don't have relatives who will rejoice with them. But they know Pastor Gene loves them, and they know Pastor Gene will rejoice with them. So they pull up, Pastor, I want to show you my car. Can I show you my car? And, you know, a lot of times it's not like old geezers. A lot of times it's teenagers, and God blesses them with a car. Pastor, I want to show you my car. And, and then, then they, they say, Pastor, we want you to pray over our house. You can't believe what God did. We want you to come pray over our house. And, and why would they do that if, if they didn't know that we would rejoice with them? We're, we're happy. What kind of person doesn't rejoice when their brother in the Lord gets blessed? What, what kind of person does not rejoice when their brother in the Lord gets a better job? What kind of person does not rejoice when... The, and you, and you, you young people, you got to watch this. You know, you, you watch girls, they're all girlfriends, they're all happy, they're all hanging out until one of them gets a boyfriend. Then they all become haters. We, we need to stop all of this and we need to be happy when our brothers and sisters see their dreams coming to pass. Because I got that right here. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. See, that's what Cain had. That's the spirit Cain had. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. And this is all based on their actions being evil. Now, let's wrap this up in Jude. And whenever any preacher says, let's go to the book of Jude, man, you better buckle your seatbelt. Jude chapter 1, look at verse 3. Dear, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men, say it out loud, certain men. Certain. Say it again, certain men. Certain. Say it again, certain men. Certain. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. That's why at Faith Christian Center... You have to be here nine months before we'll let you work in the nursery or work in the children's church or work wherever. I got this from Fred Price. His, his uh, time frame was a year. And back when we initiated this policy, I thought, oh my gosh, if I, go a, if I have a year qualification, we're not going to get any help. So we, we set it at nine months. We just never bothered to change it. But Paul wrote, know them that labor among you. There are churches here in the Metroplex you could visit there today and get on staff by February. But not here. Because Paul wrote, see, I'm going by the word. I'm not going by what's popular. I'm going by the word. Paul wrote, know them that labor among you. And it's bad enough even with all the bars we have set up because sometimes we find out we thought we knew somebody, but we didn't know them. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men, listen to this, who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And that's what these preachers are doing. 
the so-called grace message. Anybody that has been here a while knows I teach grace all the time. Didn't I mention it as I began talking about God's grace and mercy and the life coaching he gave Cain? We're talking about grace all the time, but grace does not mean that you don't have to obey the word. Grace does not mean that you get to cheat on your wife. Grace does not mean you can go uh, and become a drunkard. That's not grace. These are, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Verse 5, though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, we don't do it every year, but we ought to teach on Numbers 13 and 14 every year and then go to Hebrews 3 and 4, which Hebrews 3 and 4 is the New Testament interpretation of what happened in Numbers 13 and 14. You know the story. They crossed the desert. They came out of Egypt. They crossed the desert. Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land, a spy from each tribe. Ten came back with an evil report. Two came back with a good report. The crowd decided to believe the evil report, and those men who brought the evil report, God killed them that day, and those who believed the evil report, they marched around in the desert for 40 years, one day, one year for every day, the spies were in the promised land until they died off. So Jude's interpretation is, well, God killed them. Now the four words used in Hebrews 3 and 4, shedding light on Numbers 13 and 14, are sin, rebellion, disobedience, and unbelief. And so here Jude says that though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. See, you can get some people out of Egypt, but some people you can't get the Egypt out of them. Let me run that by again. Some people you can get out of Egypt, but you can't get the Egypt out of them. And that, the, all this rehearsing to me, you know what, what you learn from your pastor, your 15 past pastors, you have to understand my perspective. You have to understand my perspective. I knew Finest Jennings Day. I knew Kenneth Hagin. I knew Oral Roberts. I knew T.L. Osborne. I knew John Osteen. I know Fred Price. And nobody here, nobody here has been pastored by the likes of them. I knew every great man, not worldwide, but I knew every, Lester Sumrall, I knew every great man in my day in my country. Yeah, but my pastor, yeah, okay, so what kind of pastor are we talking We're talking about one of those drinking pastors, or we're talking about one of these pastors that pastors 30 people? He destroyed those who did not believe. Now, okay, so let's, let's take a little two-minute two diversion. The people he destroyed, well, they were Egyptians, right? The people he destroyed. They were Hittites, right? The people he destroyed. They were Jebusites, right? The people he destroyed. They were Amorites, right? 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 Who did he destroy? His own. Tell your neighbor, there's no free pass, no free pass. For, having no faith. for having no faith. Look at verse 11. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. All right, now he's going to define the way of Cain. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's heir. What was Balaam's heir? Balaam prophesied for the enemies of Israel for money. See, rather than anybody giving me some kind of negative review, they really ought to say salute. At least the guy believes what he's teaching because apparently he, he, he's, not, he's not pandering to get a crowd or to get an offering. Amen. So, you know, I may not agree with it, but salute. At least the guy's not a panderer, but a lot of what's going on today is pandering. 
I'll tell you what you want to hear so you'll come back next Sunday. I'll tell you what you want to hear so you'll give three, three, three nickels in the offering. I'll tell you what you want to hear so, so I'll get a four or five star. There's only one review I care about. And that's the review coming up at the judgment seat of Christ. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's Arab. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. There we have it again. The same reference we saw earlier, and now we see it again, Korah's rebellion. Sin, disobedience, rebellion, and all of it is based in what? Unbelief. Four synonyms out of Hebrews 3 and 4. Verse 12, these men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown, uh, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit. Say it out loud, without fruit. Without Say it out loud, clouds without rain. Clouds without Say it again, without fruit. Without fruit. Trees, without fruit. trees without fruit. Clouds without rain. Clouds without rain. Look. If you don't live in the Metroplex, you need to find out where you're going to church if that man or woman that's pastoring there has ever cast the devil out of anybody. You need to find out if they've ever laid their hands on the sick and seen tumors disappear. Look, I'm telling you, I would not play around with having mediocre leadership, not in 2020. You need to, you need to be in a place and hear the Word of God taught by somebody who knows how to do the works of Jesus. And, and all these people that want to pick a fight with me and criticize and post negative stuff, you let them get cancer and guess where they're going to show up next Sunday. These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. Twice dead. What does that mean? Well, the first death and the second death, they are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shames, wandering stars. We got that word wandering again. They can't settle. They can't settle. Wandering stars for whom the black, blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Sounds like a bunch you don't want to hang out with. Sounds like a bunch you don't want to invite to your potluck. <laughs> then look at verse 16. These men are grumblers and fault finders. So let's say, let's say I decided, you know, we need to do some, we need to have a culture of self-evaluation. And, uh, and we need to ask ourselves, what could we do to improve our nursery? What could we do to improve our children's church? What could we do to, to make St. Paul's a better experience? Do, do I go find everybody that hates my guts and ask them? Oh, I know, I know. I go find everybody that in the 2019 giving record gave less than $100, and I'll ask them. They'll really help me. They'll really help me. No, who would I ask? Talk to me, who would I ask? The unfaithful, or would I ask the faithful? The faithful. I'd ask the faithful. See, if you really want to find out some information that will help you, you want to go to somebody who has an investment. Amen. That's right. Amen. Anybody got a losing brother-in-law? Let me see your hand. You got a losing brother-in-law. Don't be bashful. Don't be ashamed. You got a losing brother-in-law. Well, some of you aren't raising your hands because he's here. <laughs> would, you go to that, would you go to that losing brother-in-law for advice, adv 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 advice on investments? But see, this is what people do. Paul said this is going to be a sign of the end times, which is where we are right now. They have itching ears, and they find teachers who tell them what they want to hear. And you have to understand my perspective. I've already outlived my father's father. I've already outlived my father's brother. I've already outlived my father. Every day is a gift. And whether it is tomorrow or 20 years from now, I will be judged. 
And that's what's on my mind. Not how many stars I have on the, you know, credit cred website. And you realize, they say, well, you know, it's there forever. No, it's not. This earth is going to be remodeled. It's going to be burned up. So everything posted on the web is going to go away. And I will live forever. And some stars will shine more brightly than others. So don't think you can disobey God and you're just going to shine as bright as Oral Roberts on the other side. And it's not going to work like that. Verse 16, wrapping it up. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others, flatter others, flatter others for their advantage. Oh my gosh. That is the model of church growth in 2020. They flatter others for their own advantage. But you have to understand my perspective. I'm going to be judged. That's my perspective. I'm going to be judged. So I got to tell you the truth. Bud Sickler used to tell the story about how that after he'd been in Kenya a while, he went, his first assignment was up in what they called Western Kenya. And uh, you understand that was before you could cross those oceans on Boeing. I don't even think McDonnell Douglas was building a plane back in those days that crossed those oceans. So they, they took a, a steamer. It wasn't a cruise ship. You know, they were on a cargo ship, just rented a berth in a cargo ship and got to Kenya. Then they went up country to Western Kenya. And he's out there winning people to the Lord, trying to establish the kingdom of God. And he was praying about money one day. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, don't ever pray about money like this to me again, so long as you are robbing my people. And Bud protested and he said, Lord, I'm not robbing these people. He said, I, I've not taken a chicken from one of these people. He said, I haven't, I'm not robbing these people. And he said, well, you're not teaching them my word. You're not, you're not teaching them my word on money. You're not teaching them my word on tithing. And Bud protested again, and he said, Lord, I can't teach these people about tithing. He said, they're, they're still going topless. He said, they don't have shoes to wear. He said, a lot of them don't have enough to eat. The, no, no child that he had come across where he was had shoes. He said, I can't teach these people about money. And the Lord spoke to him, and he said, that's it, that's it. He said, you're just like all of my other servants. You're killing my people with human mercy. So I could stand up here this, this morning and tell you that you can't do it. God expects too much. I know the word says this, but God doesn't really expect it. Just, just, you know, just give what you have in your pocket. And God will bless you just as much as he blesses the guy that uh, gave a half a million dollars last year. But I'd be lying to you. I could stand up here and tell you, I could pander to you and tell you that God doesn't expect one doggone thing from you. But you know what I'd be doing? I'd be robbing you. I got men here this morning and they're not, I don't think they'd be offended by me saying they're not gifted, they're not talented, they never played for the Dallas Cowboys, praise the Lord, maybe they should have played for somebody else, you know. Uh, they, they, they were never movie stars. Uh, they never worked in Hollywood. Some of them don't even have a college education. But they just came in here and they heard the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They just came in here and heard the word and they began not doing what was evil. They, maybe they had been doing what was evil, but they changed. They changed. They changed and they began doing what was right and they believed the word. Like Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And I know, I know it's staggering. I know it's staggering. I, I know, I know it's hard to get your mind around. I got men in this church make over a million dollars a year. Not, not, not occasionally, year in and year out. I got men in this church who make over a million dollars a year. And when they came to me, they, they, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. And I, I got news for you. I got more men coming up and they may not be at that level, but they're coming up. They're coming up 
they're going to make a million dollars a year. Somebody might say, well, well, is it, is it just all about that? No, you got to love your wife. You got to love your children. You got to be a blessing to your children. Didn't I just, didn't I just teach about love, walking in love, loving your brother? Well, your closest brother is your wife. Your closest brother is your husband. Your closest brother is your children. So anybody can do it. Say it out loud. The word works, the word works. For, anybody for anybody who works the word. Works the word. What, they, what else do they say in alcohol and Alcoholics Anonymous? Keep coming back. Well, I heard enough word, frankly, to last me until Easter. Well, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I could never get enough of it. Michaela was in the car the other day and, uh, you know, the program switched over and a new voice came on and Michaela says, that's grandpa. She said, that, babe, sweetheart, that's not grandpa, that's Fred Price. She said, that's grandpa. And Sue said, sweetheart, that, that's, not, that's not your grandpa, that's Fred Price. She said, well, then Fred Price sounds like grandpa. <laughs> and Sue said, sweetheart, Fred Price is older than your grandpa, so technically Fred Price doesn't sound like grandpa. Grandpa sounds like Fred Price. Amen. And you know how that happens? You know how that happens? Because we're all teaching the same stuff. Amen. That's how that happens. You listen to Kenneth Hagin, you got that, you know, country twang. Listen to John Osteen, it's a different voice, but it's the same message, the same message, the same message, the same message. It works. The Word of God works for anybody who works the Word. So you got to work the Word and you got to keep coming back. And everybody, by the, by the way, last thing, I'm out of time, but the last thing I'm going to repeat the Holy Spirit on is this. Every one of those guys, they came from nothing and reached those levels. They are here every time the doors are open. Amen. Without exception. Amen. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God.